My name is Natalie Wood. I'm the director of NCSL's Center for Legislative Strengthening. My team and I provide resources and information on all things legislative institution. And this session is part of our track of sessions here at Summit. We have several others tomorrow and on Wednesday. So I hope you click on the legislative institution track on your app and check out some of the other things we're going to be talking about. But most importantly, um, you're here today ostensibly because you are part of the George Washington fan club, I bet. He's an easy guy to like. But you might also be here because you are, like me, part of the Ben Sawyer fan club. Dr. Ben Sawyer has been gracious enough to be part of our legislative summit for four years running now, telling stories, making us laugh, and helping us learn a little bit about history along the way. Ben is a senior instructor of history at Middle Tennessee State University and has been there for nine years. He's also a stand-up comedian, a trivia quiz master, and along with Bob Crawford of the Ava Brothers is the co-host of The Road to Now. In 2021, Road to Now was recently selected as the Ken Burns Top Podcast Moment of 2021 and one of Reader's Digest's 12 political podcasts to keep you informed. He loves to talk to diverse audiences who, it turns out, have far more in common than they suspect. And I hope you'll give him a warm welcome. Thanks, Ben. Thanks to Natalie and all you guys being out here. I'm a little worried when she said, if you're in the George Washington fan club, I didn't see too many people clapping. You guys waiting for me to take this dude down or something? Finally, somebody's taking on Washington. I don't think he'd notice. He's been dead for a while. Um, I would first of all like to say thank you to NCSL for putting this on and inviting me to be here. It's been amazing to work with this group for the last five years, and it's always a privilege to come to speak to all of you. I'd like to give a special thanks to uh, the members here from Tennessee. Uh, I work at Middle Tennessee State University, and your support keeps the school going. And I can tell you right now that even though you don't see what's happening, uh, there are lots of leaders in my class that I see coming to the fore every day, and it's a real gift to do that. So thank you for support and for supporting your own educational institutions in your, in your state. It goes a long way. Now, I figure a lot of you guys out there are thinking, come on, this guy's going to talk about George Washington and leadership? That's, that's like so easy, you know? Some of you guys are probably thinking, like, if he was any good at this, he would talk about some deep cut president. You know, like William Henry Harrison or something? You know what I'm saying? So, okay, William Henry Harrison, let's do that. Um, <laughs> William Henry Harrison's actually did a lot more things and he's got lessons he can teach us and I don't think that people really appreciate how much he accomplished while he was in office. So let's just talk about some of the records that he set, okay? Uh, he was inaugurated March 4th, 1841, okay? At the time, he was the oldest president and he kept that title until 1981 when Ronald Reagan took office. And that lasted until 2016, 2017, 2021. I mean, I'm, you know, at this point, I'm just waiting for Carter to run again. He's got another term <laughs> left in him. So this guy, this guy comes in, already set the record for being oldest president ever inaugurated. And uh, they made fun of him for it a lot. They were like, he's too old, he's too old. And so to, the, to prove to them that he wasn't old and weak, he went up and he uh, set another record. He gave the longest inauguration speech in American history, one hour and 45 minutes, a record that still stands and God willing will always stand. <laughs> and you know, he gave that talk and I guess he thought he proved something to him and you're probably surprised, you know, that guy's already set two records right there right off the bat. Surely he couldn't do another one, but he did pretty quickly because he gave that talk uh, in the rain, in the cold, with no jacket on, so uh, he has the shortest term in office too because he fell ill and died 32 days later and thus became the first president ever to die in office. And uh, the lessons I took away from that were don't talk too long uh, and dress appropriately. Those were two that I thought would be good to share with you guys that we could learn. 32 days and so many lessons, you know? I'm sure at this point some of you guys are like, ah, yeah, that's cool, you can do president, but can you do a Supreme Court justice? Lessons from a Supreme Court Justice? I sure can, okay? William Howard Taft was the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court from 1921 to 1930. He was also the President before that, I know, I know. There's lots of lessons from him. I bet you guys didn't even know that about him being on the Supreme Court, did you? You did? That's good. But, but those of you guys who didn't, what's the one thing you all know about Taft? Bathtub. Bathtub. Which honestly sounds weird. I guess you didn't want to say he was big, okay? He was. By the way, the story about him getting stuck in a bathtub, just to be clear here, he did not get stuck in a bathtub, okay? 
what he did was he saw he might, and so he asked him to make a bigger one. That's what he did. And they say true power is never having to say you're sorry. I think true power is being like, hey, make me a bigger bathtub, and they just do it. <laughs> think about Taft. People give Taft a hard time for being so big, but, you know, like, honestly, this was over 100 years ago. you got to give the man credit, okay? He didn't do this by just stopping through the drive-thru every day. This dude had to work at it. You know what I'm saying? Late nights, his wife's like, you coming to bed? And she's just like, not till I finish this steak, woman. I'm trying to make history, you know? <laughs> he did. Now, my favorite story about Taft is apocryphal, okay? And as a historian, I have to say this. I don't, this isn't confirmed, but I did read it. And because it's so fantastic, I'm going to share it with you right now. But just know, it may not be true, but it's full of lessons, okay? Here we go. The first part is true. Taft was the first ever U.S. president to go speak in Mexico. He did this in 1909. He crossed just across the border and he gave a talk to the Mexican people. And apparently, and this is the apocryphal part, uh, behind him on the entryway into the United States was a huge sign that said, welcome. Uh, but apparently the night before he went to give that talk, a storm came through and it blew the W off of the sign. So he was talking in front of a sign that to us would say, Elkum, but to people in Mexico would say, El Come, which means he eats. <laughs> And I can imagine they were like, we could tell. We didn't need the sign, but thank you for that. It was nice of you. We can see him from here. Uh, so a couple lessons from that. Uh, sometimes what you're doing isn't what they're seeing. And uh, be aware of your environment. That's really important lessons there from William Howard Taft. All right, now, some of you guys are like, is he ever going to get to George Washington at this point? And I am, OK? George Washington, not just the president, but also a state legislator from Virginia. So there we go. Let's talk about Washington, okay? On December 14, 1799, George Washington died. It was the last thing he ever did, and I... <laughs> and I am completely sincere when I say this. It was one of the only things he got to do that he wanted to. Dying at home. Because for the last quarter of a century, this man could not get anything done without Americans going to him and telling him that the entire existence of the, of the, of the country relied upon him showing up and doing something he did not want to do. And he got to do this, but it wasn't secure. This is a real story, okay? When Washington died, a family friend got there a little bit later who was a physician and proposed to Martha Washington that he try a procedure he had recently heard about to reanimate a corpse. Washington would have been so mad. <laughs> Not just because he came back, but also because they drained like five to six quarts of blood out of him in the last few hours of life. It would have been a really bad zombie is what I'm saying. So Martha declined, God bless her. When Washington died, he had left behind a plan for his funeral. The men in his, the men in his life were short-lived. He knew that. So he wanted to make sure he had all of his arrangements in order. He requested that when he die, no fuss be made about it. That there be a small gathering of people for a small ceremony at Mount Vernon. And that he essentially be buried there on the land. That's what he wanted. But what he got was a massive funeral at his house, throngs of people there, more than 300 eulogies, and more than 400 mock funerals across 16 of the 17 states then in existence. To quote Lindsay Trevinsky, a great presidential historian, even after he died, people wouldn't stop making Washington do things for them. <laughs> now, everyone at the time, not everyone, but a large number of people at the time had this reverence for Washington that was absolutely unique. They saw him as irreplaceable. They didn't think that the country had anyone else who could do what he did. And today, I want to actually make the point that Washington was a central figure at the time, but probably not for the reasons that most Americans think. And I want to walk you through this, because I do agree. This country, I don't think, if you, if you take one figure out of that founding generation and they're not there, and it doesn't go right, I mean, it's Washington. Washington's the one person who time and time again did something that few other people could do. So I want to teach you that and have you walk away from it, but first we've got to get past a real, a real elephant in the room when it comes to talking about any of the founders in this country. 
we've got to get past this mythology of the founders. <laughs> Our predecessors were human beings, not heroes or monsters. I love paintings like this, but here's a real one. These folks did not fulfill destinies, okay? They lived lives full of uncertainty, just like all of us. Same blood in their veins we all had. They had doubts. They made bad decisions sometimes. They did not know where their life was going. And if you do not appreciate about these folks, if you're unwilling to see the bad or good in these human beings, then you forget that they are human beings. And this has real consequences, and we see this all the time, I think. And we don't, when we deny the humanity of people in the past, our shared history becomes a point of division. And you all know what I'm talking about. You've all got a family member who's had a text exchange like this or a Facebook exchange like this. Jefferson was the greatest American. No, he wasn't. He was the worst American. Well, you're a Nazi. You're a communist. And then somebody's not coming to Thanksgiving. It's a common thing. And the reality is that conversation had nothing to do with Jefferson. It had everything to do with the two people on the other end who had an unnuanced view and were putting this human being up as a logo of what they believe now. We've got to move past that. Another big problem is this. If we deny that the, all of the folks in the past had the possibility and the ability to fail, the possibility to make a worse decision, the possibility to make a selfish decision, if we deny them that ability, we actually deny them the opportunity to achieve greatness. Because greatness is something that we earn. It's something we work for. If we say this person was destined to be that way, we essentially say they are not great, if you ask me. And finally, if we think greatness is inherent, if it's something someone was born with and has no agency in whatsoever in their lives, we cease to expect that out of ourselves. The worst person you've ever read about in history and the greatest person you've ever read about in history all have the same blood in their veins that you do. They made a series of decisions that led them down that path. Do not deny yourself the opportunity to be the greatest or worst person of your generation. Somebody's got to be, right? So when we talk about Washington, I think there are three critical moments here where you really see the leadership he shows that, that, that really almost you can't imagine someone at that time doing. Not that someone couldn't have done it, but that no one else was doing it, I guess I should say. The three critical moments come, and the first one's the biggest. I think everything that follows in Washington's life has to do with leading the Continental Army and how he handles that. Then the second is establishing the Constitution. The third is defining the presidency, both of which come out of the legacy he creates for himself and the way he handles himself leading the, the Patriot Army. To get any of this, though, to get anything about Washington and why he matters at the time, You've got to understand that this first generation of Americans has a very unique experience with the British that leaves them with a very big concern. Throughout this first generation in the early republic, the founders are caught between the hope of securing liberties and the absolute fear of tyranny. The abuses they suffered under the hands of the British with no recourse whatsoever, no voice to speak out, these, this is in the DNA of these founders. They are terrified of recreating that situation again. During the Revolution, this, this actually plays out in the form of, of the Continental Army. Because you need to have a large-scale army that can coordinate between 13 colonies if you're going to have any chance of winning this fight. But creating that army is creating a singular force that could potentially crush any of the 13 individual states later on. It plays out after that in drafting the Constitution. Because the founders recognize the need for an executive eventually, but they fear creating a position that will give one person enough power to break the other divisions. And as we see in, in both of these cases, Washington's going to play a crucial role. So let's get to the first one, leading the Continental Army. Most of you guys know this, this painting, huh? This epic painting. You guys know it was painted in 1851? I, I, maybe you did. But I think most people go, that's what he was doing at that time. That's how he held his mouth. You know, you just imagine that. It's created by a guy who wasn't there. A lot of these images we have are created by people who weren't there, and then people get in fights over them as if they were, you know, photographs or something. 
This depicts Washington crossing the Delaware, a pretty insane and brilliant act that, he, that, that Washington took out, uh, undertook on December 25th, 1776. It was miserable. The river was frozen, you know? It, it, horses were drowning. If you've ever thought you had a bad Christmas, I'll bet it wasn't that bad, okay? This is a good one to emphasize because in the first several years of the Revolutionary War, this is kind of the one time you see Washington getting a win. The previous four to five months, the Washington's troops had spent uh, their time getting beaten across New Jersey. They then encamped across the river. They had a sneak attack. They, they pulled off a sneak attack. That's what this was. It was a morale booster, but it didn't turn the tide of the war. In fact, they went into camp after this for the winter in 1777. Things thawed out. They got back to getting their butts kicked across another part of the United States. And that's what they would do for several years after that. So let's put this in context, because Washington took on this position. You've got to really appreciate how mad it is to take this job before you appreciate him for taking it, OK? So here's the context, OK? In April of 1775, American colonists begin shooting at the world's most powerful empire. The following month, the Second Continental Congress meets in Philadelphia and agrees to establish a Continental Army, again, reluctantly. This is not something any of the individual states would have probably done if it were not for the stressful moment that they were in. And even then, it doesn't look good, okay? And now I'm going to share with you one of the favorite, my favorite parts of the classes that I teach. Because just like this, you only have so much time to convey a big idea, so here we go, all right? You guys watch ESPN, how they do a pregame rundown, and you see those pregame rundowns where it's like University of Alabama versus Blackman High School, and they got to say something. <laughs> you know, so they reach. All right, here we go, okay? Let's do a pregame rundown of the Patriots versus the British, all right? Here we go. All right, British Navy is number one in the world in the AP and coaches poll. <laughs> They've got all the number one votes. Nobody disagrees with that whatsoever, okay? Now, their army, uh, number one AP, number two coaches. All right, it's debatable. The French might be number one. We don't know until they play each other. Actually, they recently did in the French loss, but that's going to change. Okay, so, and not only that, man, the British have a deep bench. You want to know why? Because of Hessians. <laughs> mercenaries, baby. You just call them in. There ain't no NCAA rules. Bring them right in. Your guys get injured, get yourself some Hessians, and they will. Now, let's do the pregame rundown of the Patriots. All right, here we go. Not the New England Patriots. Sorry, some of you guys are like, woo, go Patriots. All right, the Patriot Army here. Their Navy, let's check them out. Okay, uh, they don't exist. They don't even have one. All right, it's like MTSU's ice hockey team, okay? You can say it, doesn't make it real. All right. What? They got an army that was established, what's it say here, the other day. All right. That's great. Um, cool. Uh, and they have never played on the same team until now, so this is shaping up to be a real match. But wait, there's more. Because they have almost no money. They're fighting amongst themselves, and nobody else believes they're a real country. All right, so here we go. Essentially, America is trying to take out a home mortgage without any proof they were ever born. <laughs> but I promise, that ain't going to work. So in the middle of this, you got to admit, there's a lot at stake for Washington, OK? Because on June 15, 1775, he accepts the commission as commander in chief. Or, to put it in British words, Washington is now a marked traitor. He has just put his name on this army, and I don't know if you know anything about the way the British treated traitors. It's not good. You think they might uh, hang them? Yep. Draw and quarter them? Yep. Burn them alive? Yep. All three. Yeah, there's cases of them hanging people till they're almost dead, taking them down, drawing and quartering them, ripping their arms out of their sockets, then dragging their body over to a pile of wood and setting them on fire. It's a triple crown, I guess you'd say, back then. And Washington, by taking this position, is becoming the head of this, of this Patriot Army. He's, he's got a bullseye on his head. But surely, surely there's got to be something, right? Like some of you guys are going, you couldn't pay me to do that. Well, guess what? They couldn't pay anybody anything. <laughs> so you're qualified. But not only that, Washington actually declines any money whatsoever for this. He only wants to see that his expenses are reimbursed. He does it out of a sense of duty. And if you're wondering how he felt about it, 
here's a, this is upon accepting this, uh, this commission, here's a actual lines from his acceptance. Uh, I feel great distress from a consciousness that my abilities and military experience may not be equal to the extensive and important trust. I do not think myself to, equal to the command I am honored with. Great. We can do it right. He's like, oh, I don't think so, probably not. Uh, And to be fair, that's an honest assessment. Washington had served in the Virginia militia during the French and Indian War. He had blown it really bad for necessity, but a lot of people had looked at him and said, okay, this guy actually has some potential, and then he stepped down and left. He had no experience commanding this large of an army. He had no experience through years and years of bitter warfare, but he took it on. And when he took it on, he didn't ask other people to take the risks. He was right there with him. And everyone understood that perhaps he was the one with the most on the line. And this is why these next years, as the Patriot Army retreats and basically doesn't know what it feels like to win, Washington's able to keep things together. From, that, from those battles at the end of 1776 to 1780, Washington's most significant accomplishments are coordinating effective retreats to avoid capture, which who doesn't love that? Hey, you want to be a general? Yep. What are you good at? Running away. I'm real good at it. <laughs> but it is amazing if you know anything about military strategy, his deception to make the British think he was going to fight them the next day, and then they get up the next morning, whoop, not there. <laughs> and that's what you got to do, honestly. That's a war of attrition. Essentially, the, the patriots are trying to wear out the British. They believe that eventually the, the opinion will turn against the, the war and that they'll leave. So this actually turns out to be a pretty key characteristic that you wouldn't understand unless you understood what the goal was. Again, sometimes these things are surprising when you look into the history. He also has to keep soldiers on the field, and I cannot tell you how hard this is to do at the time. He even writes a letter back to Congress at the end of 1776, who Congress is not paying these people. When they do, they pay them in continental currency, which is the equivalent of you all working at Best Buy, and then they pay you in Best Buy gift cards and then go bankrupt. <laughs> they go, don't worry, when we get out of Chapter 13, we'll pay these back. But Washington manages to do this. There's a couple ways he does it. Number one, when his men ha are desperate, he takes out personal loans himself. He, he uses his own resources to help pay the men. He works with a guy named Robert Morris to find resources for these folks to keep them around. As he says in that letter to Congress at the end of 1776, anger and passion will get people to start fighting, but eventually they're going to get hungry. You've got to look after their long-term well-being. And Washington sincerely cares about this throughout the war. That's crucial, too, because as they go into camp after this, after, at the end of 1776, a lot of his men's enlistment are up. These men are farmers. Many of them do not have firearms. Many of them do not have shoes. They're out in the freezing cold, and they've known nothing but loss. That victory that he pulled off, or those victories when he crossed the Delaware, that was largely to show them what it felt like to win. But he's up against the fact that these folks are out. They've been away from their homes for a very long time. When it turns cold, their thought turns to home. They don't know if the crop came in. They don't know what their family's doing. They don't know if people have found out they're out fighting for Washington and that they've lost everything. But when they're sitting there in the cold, underfed and under-resourced, it's a lot of time to think about that. Washington doesn't leave. A lot of officers have that opportunity. They can go into the city, leave their men out to field. But throughout this war, Washington will stay out there with them. He shares the sacrifice and he shares the suffering of his soldiers. He puts himself on the line. These are the marks, I think, of a leader. His intangibles, his personal sacrifice to achieve a common goal. See, these things don't show up on a spreadsheet. They don't show up in the stats, but people notice. His willingness to share the suffering of the war. And a final thing, his recognition and fostering of young talent is off the charts. If you look at how he starts this war and the people who come into his camp and Washington ends up giving a chance to lead, this is Alexander Hamilton. This is the Marquis de Lafayette. This is Baron von Steuben. All immigrants who left their own countries for various reasons. To be fair, Lafayette just wanted to kill British people because they killed his dad. But the rest of them exiled, essentially, are, are having to leave their own homes. Von Steuben really exiled Hamilton having no opportunity at home. 
he brings these people up. They're all people that, that you probably know about. And Washington is, is key to this. Fostering, fostering future talent is an essential part of being a leader and leaving a legacy. Now, things do turn well because the French show up. I know it's hard to accept that, but they do help us out a lot. And to a lot of people, this is the key moment in the Revolutionary War. Cornwallis has surrendered to um, French and Patriot troops. This is a key moment in this war because this is essentially it. The British are done. It's going to take them two years to finally accept that and sign the paperwork. But this is the end of major operations. Washington's going to stick around for a while after that because until the war is formally, the, the treaty is formally signed, the army has to stand. Which brings us to what I think is actually the most remarkable accomplishment of Washington during the war. The fact that he just gave up power afterwards. At a time when people's signature concern was that they would create a position that would create a monster. When the war is over, this guy, not because they asked him to, but because he starts sending letters saying, hey, should I come do it in person or by uh, mail? He hands over power. I want you to put this in context, please. Think of the modern revolutions. Think of the revolutions that have taken place since this point in time. You can list them off pretty easily. Think where they lead. The French Revolution leads to Napoleon. The Russian Revolution leads to Stalin. The Chinese Revolution leads to Mao. The Cuban Revolution leads to Castro. In every other case, the person who leads the army to victory in the revolution or seizes power shortly thereafter does not go till they either die or are forced out. By going home and ceding this power back to Congress, Washington does something that is remarkable. He not just acknowledges that authority comes through Congress, he also acknowledges that the country does not need him as a figure to thrive. He just goes home. And if he had had his choice, he would have stayed there. But as it turns out, things are going to get worse, okay? Things are going to get worse. And this brings me to the second part, his role in establishing the Constitution. Okay, this is going to be the biggest one, I think, of like, what do people know? What do they need to know? This is kind of the hardest one here because Americans have a blank spot on the 1780s like no other period, okay? My students are constantly getting the Declaration of Independence and Constitution confused. Also, I don't know how often you see a sticker that looks like this, I do. If you don't know why it's funny, it's because the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, but we the people is from the preamble of the Constitution, which was written in 1787. I appreciate the spirit, but uh, as a history professor, I can't get close enough to people's cars while I'm driving to like mark them off, but if you know anyone with this sticker, talk to them, all right? You can love this country, but you know, get the facts right sometimes. All right. So here's the thing. Most people know the Declaration of Independence, they know the Constitution, right? But let's, uh, let's, let's look at this, okay? Here's a, here's a brief timeline and explanation, okay? July 4, 1776, Congress adopts the Declaration of Independence. March 4, 1789, the first government under the Constitution meets. Hmm. I'm sure it's just a test which I love as a professor. It's great to see a test going on right now while I'm up here. Is everything okay? Amber alert, okay, okay. Keep your eyes open. All right, so. All right, so there's this weird gap in between, okay? Now, I want to give you my trick for making sure you never confuse these documents and you know it's between, okay? Let's put this in simple terms. Uh, the Declaration of Independence is a breakup letter. That's all it is. It's like any other breakup letter, all right? You tried to talk for a while, they're still ignoring you, they won't sit down and reason with you, so you gotta write a letter. It goes, I've got these rights and these are the reasons we can't be together, all right? That's what it is. It doesn't establish a charter of government. The Constitution, in terms of relationships, well, that's who you marry, all right? 
The one you truly love, the one you find, you're going to have a long, like 240, so God knows, hopefully longer than that relationship, you know? You fight sometimes, but ultimately you know you're better off together, right? But like all relationships, there's this weird blank spot that people don't talk about in between, you know? What usually happens between the big breakup with a long-term uh, relationship and finding the person you want to marry? What's that? Uh, rebounds, right? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in between those two documents is America's rebound, the Articles of Confederation. And just like every rebound, you know, you kind of in crisis, you rush into it, you know it's not going to work, but you messed around and moved in together, so you got to kind of deal with it. And that's where we are in the 1780s, that moment of crisis and waking up to the fact that you've got to move on. Now, after securing independence, the states have little in common. This article's government is not equipped to actually solve many problems. And by the mid-1870s, the United States is essentially facing a national security crisis. Checking my time here. Good. And this is serious. I mean, the country is on the verge of collapse in the 1780s. Here's why. The federal government and several state governments cannot repay the wartime debt that they borrowed, and they cannot back up the fiat currency they've paid soldiers in. Essentially, during the revolution, Congress just starts churning out what are called continental dollars. I know this is going to sound crazy to you guys, but it's not actually backed up by anything except for your faith that the government will go on. They In the 1780s, there was nothing to back it up. Veterans were going home, facing taxes, and the state governments would not even accept the money these veterans had been paid to pay their own taxes. I don't know about you guys, you work in, you know, legislat in legislatures at the state level, but imagine a situation in which you asked the National Guard to go, go serve overseas for, I don't know, eight years, and when they came back, the cryptocurrency you paid them in was no longer valid. Well, they might do things like, I don't know, rise up in a portion of your state and proclaim that it's a different state now. Anybody know about the state of Franklin in North Carolina? The folks up in the hills, the forerunners of Tennessee, decided that they were their own state, and whenever the governor of North Carolina said, no, you're not, they said, come make us not be, and he was like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I don't know if you know anything about the over-mountain men or the American Revolution. Don't go up in the hills. They're strong. They walk uphill a lot, okay? Across the country, veterans are turning against ignoring state governments, and this is going to reach ahead because in 1786, in Massachusetts, a group of Western farmers who were furious with the extensive taxation are going to rise up and try to overthrow the government of Massachusetts, and they're going to get pretty close. This puts a point on the stick of needing to fix these things. And the looming thing that we don't like to acknowledge as Americans I mean, look, I'm with you. When you say that we were independent in 1776, I'm with you, okay? And yes, in 1783, the British did sign the divorce papers. But let's just say they're pretty convinced we're going to come back at some point. Go out there, be on your own, like your parents. They're like, oh, you want to be independent? Go ahead. If you find out how much the cell phone bill is, you'll be back, you know? And they're waiting for it. And the national security crisis comes from an obvious fact. If your lenders won't lend to you anymore because you didn't repay them and your soldiers won't fight anymore because you paid them in worthless currency, good luck fending off the British request to bring you back into the fold. You're not even going to have what you had before. So through all this, in September of 1786, delegates from several states call for a convention to revise the Articles. It's going to be held in Philadelphia the following May, but it's actually not clear if these states will attend, especially the New England states. After this, George Washington, who's at home, who wants nothing to do with any of this, is informed that he has been appointed the president of Virginia's delegation to this constitutional convention. They didn't ask him. They were like, congratulations, you've been elected chairman of the board, page player $50, get back at it. He tries his damnedest to get out of it. He's like, I'm good, I don't feel right. Uh, but people understand, the one thing about Washington that everyone knows, Washington will not want to do this, but if you can make him believe that serving in this position, any position, 
is serving a duty to his country and not his own interests, if you can make him think it's his duty and he needs to be there, he will. And so Madison and Hamilton and several other people spend the next several months informing Washington of how crucial it is that he shows up at this convention and finally he caves. He gets there a week early to attend a meeting of the Society of the Cincinnati. He's going to spend like four and a half months this summer in Philadelphia. And here's the best part. As soon as he gets there, they elect him president of the Constitutional Convention. They need him there because, well, first of all, the legitimacy, legitimacy to get the other states there, but there's another reason. Because as soon as the doors close on this convention, they're going to start breaking the law in that room. These delegates do not have the authority to write an entirely new document, which might come across as suspicious. But what might help is if at the front of the room sits the guy you know from before that gave up all the power and everything. Ah, you can trust him, right? And so they need him there. And he serves. Washington is not a political theorist. Washington is not a great orator. Washington does not have the economic mind of someone like Hamilton, the pen of someone like Jefferson, the voice of someone like Patrick Henry. So he just sits there at the front of the room, lending his credibility to this convention. Now, he does not want to be there. You can imagine how he would feel about then ending up in one of the positions they're creating. But Washington sits silently lending his legitimacy to a convention in which he watches them create the position of the presidency while looking at him. <laughs> Again, this balance between fear and hope. They realize that if they're going to get anything done, they need to reform the government. And as you guys know, if you're in the legislature, you guys can pass laws. You're going to need someone to execute it, right? Somebody's like, I'll take the law into my own hands. Calm down, all right? Calm down. No, you need it. And so they realize this. And really, it's hard to make the case that they would have agreed to create an executive as it came out without knowing that Washington was sitting there. He could have left at any moment, but he stayed there. And he watched them craft that position, well aware that it was meant for him. And when the convention was over, he went home. And he really hoped that he would get to stay there. But guess what? Well, you know how it ends. <laughs> he doesn't get to, again. Because as soon as he goes back, Washington is called by the people to serve as president. He begs them not to give him the job. But they're like, not give it to you. Custom fit for you. And so Washington reluctantly agrees. Now. I'm hoping every one of you in here has read the Constitution of the United States of America. If you've ever been in my class, you have to. It's 10% of the entire grade of Constitution quiz, one kid at a time. You know what I'm saying? One at a time. But if you know anything about it, you, you know, I watch my students. They get through the preamble. Okay, they had to memorize that in high school, right, or middle school. They're like, oh, just recite that. You know, be like, we the people of the United States. I had a student one time ask me, do we have to memorize the entire Constitution now that we're in college? And I was like, who hurt you? That's not what this is. If you can, that'd be impressive. But, but if you know anything, you, Article 1 is pretty dense, right? And then you get to Article 2, and it's pretty vague. It's pretty vague. Uh, here's, here's what I love. Here's a couple of my favorite moments from, from Article 2. Now, we know how it's going to pan out because president had been set. But you just got to imagine this is the job description, and you're the first person taking the job, okay? Uh, there's a quote line in there. May require, uh, he may require the opinion in writing of the principal officer of each in, of the executive departments. But it does not list the executive departments. So I guess you got to come up with those. There's also some great phrasing in there, too. He shall from time to time give to the Congress information. That's vague as hell. <laughs> but like, hey, man, you want to come over? Yeah, I'll come over from time to time. When is that? <laughs> is that frequent? Not that often? I don't know. He may on extraordinary occasions convene both houses. What does that mean? It's vague. It had to be vague. Get everybody in that room to agree on it. it. Had to stay a little vague. So Washington has watched them craft it. He's well aware of how vague it is. They then drag him up to New York to lay all this out. And he does. 
And if you want to know how happy he is about it, all you got to do is read his first inaugural address. Okay, Washington's, anytime he gets anything, commander in chief of the, of the Continental Army, first, second inaugural address, his, his farewell address, everything, he makes sure that he acknowledges those around him, he acknowledges God, he acknowledges that, that it's more than him, and he acknowledges his own flaws. Those are all so amazing to see in leadership. But the first inaugural address is, is a little more colorful. Like, he makes sure you know he doesn't want the job, like, more than usual. Among the vicissitudes to, uh, incident to life, no event could have filled me with greater anxieties <laughs> than finding out I was elected. It's much longer than that. I was summoned by my country from a retreat which I had chosen with the fondest predilection and which was rendered every day more necess necessary as well as more dear to me. <laughs> it's like, dude, you didn't have to come to dinner, you know what I'm saying? But he did. Washington makes it clear. Again, he also acknowledges his flaws. He acknowledges that he hasn't done this before. This is a big step for Washington. See, a lot of people go commander-in-chief of the, the Continental Army, commander-in-chief of the U.S. Army. There's, there's, there's a, a pathway there. But what you don't think about when, when you acknowledge this is something Washington was really worried about. By being a military official, he was free from the politics of it all. He wasn't subject to attacks. He followed orders and tried to follow them well. He petitioned for his soldiers. He had to engage the government, but he was not of a political class, and he wanted to go to the grave that way. But he didn't get to. Because when he comes in, he actually does a remarkable job of filling in all those gaps. He establishes the executive office, Department of Treasury, Department of War, Department of State. And not only that, but one thing that people miss when he's appointing both the heads of those, uh, those cabinets and the, the, the first Supreme Court justices, he makes sure to pick people from all over the country. Of his, of his executive appointees, Secretary of Treasury Alexander Hamilton from New York, Secretary of War Henry Knox from Massachusetts, Jefferson from Virginia, he's representing New England, the Mid-Atlantic, and the South, making sure that there are, I know it's not that diverse, but at the time, something that looked like representation. He also established executive authority because the question was, what could the president do? Well, he answered that question in 1894 when a bunch of people in Western Massachusetts decided they didn't want to pay the whiskey tax and rebelled. He raised an army and began leading them out there to put down the rebellion. And they found out he was coming and they just ran. Uh, he didn't even have to go all the way. He was like halfway there, he was like, Hamilton, you do this. And he was like, Hamilton was like, I thought you'd never ask. So, but he established that precedent, and then he established another precedent, because after the rebellion was done, he pardoned the people who were a part of it. He set so many precedents here. I've heard people say they think that putting your hand on the Bible is in the Constitution. It is not. All the Constitution says about religion is that you shall not be required to have a certain, take a religious oath to hold office. Why have most presidents put their hand on the Bible? Washington did. That was his choice. People followed suit. There are a lot, there's a lot more that I can get into here. But by his second term, Washington himself was becoming the target of partisan attacks. He sat and watched as the country collapsed into partisanship, into mean-spirited attacks on each other, character assassination based on policy. He had only intended to stay in that position for two years as president. He told several people this in writing. I only want to be there long enough to establish it. But he saw this start to happen, and he did what he always did. He thought that he could do something that was better for the country, so he stuck around, and he sacrificed. And after his first term, it wasn't better. He thought he could fix it. He stayed around for another term. The guy wanted to stay at home. And after eight and a half years of leading the Continental Army, this guy stayed in the middle of the federal government for another eight years. And at the end of it, he couldn't fix it. At one point, two of his closest previous friends, Jefferson and Madison, recruit a newspaper publisher to come to Philadelphia and publish a newspaper destroying Washington's reputation. Because they were worried about Corruption in the federal government, which is, I guess, why Jefferson smuggled money out of the State Department to pay the editor. Anyway, all right. I love this picture by Charles Wilson Peale from 1795 because this is in his second term. Look at the man's face. He's like, oh, again. I love it. Now, finally, on September 19, 1796, Washington announced he would not seek re-election. He published a farewell address. And just like when he died, everyone was so sure that the country couldn't do it without him. 
It was a heavy weight. People were in tears when they read this address. But he went home. And at the end of his life, the man got not quite three years of peace. And by peace, I mean him saying no to all the requests people sent to him, except for whenever Adam's asking. It, it, he ne it never stops. But at least he gets to be at home, you know, working from home. So there's a lot more I can't get into this talk. It's always the, the problem of being someone who spends their life studying something and only having an hour to go over it. But I just want to leave you guys with the lessons that I've taken from Washington, some of which may be obvious, some of which I think are, are, are perhaps deeper. In conclusion here, if you ask others to sacrifice, be willing to do so yourself. The world's full of people who were talking about, we're cutting back here, oh, we're, you know, we're really downsizing, everyone's feeling the pain around here, and you ain't feeling the pain when you say it. People gain respect and find not just bosses, but leaders. When it comes time to make sacrifices and they see the people who really mean what they're saying, and they themselves take the hit. The same thing with general suffering. When you undertake a major project, there will be suffering. Do not exempt yourself from it. These two principles right here are crucial for keeping Washington's men in the field, keeping the Army going, and securing our independence. They don't show up on spreadsheets. They don't show up in stat books. But without them, many of the, the great accomplishments in history wouldn't be there. Leadership is not one thing. We try to narrow it down, we try to define leadership, but it always depends on the goal in context. If I told you there was this amazing general in history who was really good at running away, you wouldn't want to draft him, you know what I'm saying? But when you realize this context, that leadership's there. And when I told you Washington is indispensable to forming the Constitution, yet he did not contribute a single idea, you'd be like, that makes no sense. But now you get it. Power does have a tendency to corrupt human beings, but I don't think that it is necessary. When I look at Washington's life, I see that a singular focus on achieving a goal can serve as an inoculation to corruption. Power was a means for Washington. It was not the goal. And when the means was accomplished, he surrendered the power, politically. Sometimes stepping back is the best way to move forward. Now, as you look at these things, I want you to appreciate that to get here, you had to acknowledge Washington's weakness, Washington's flaws. You had to acknowledge that the guy wasn't just constantly dominating the entire time. He knew that. People get upset when we talk about the founders having owned enslaved people. He knew that. And no, he didn't think it was just normal. He knew that it was not okay. Lafayette laid into him pretty regularly in those years, telling him you could be a model for the future of this country if you would actually yourself be the person who got rid of your enslaved people and set them free. And Washington, to his credit, did manumit the enslaved people in his will. After he died, they would, after Martha we died, he would go free. But, but you know, he didn't go all the way in. Those are things that can be true at the same time that these things are true. We don't need to make monsters or demons out of people. We need to understand that people made bad decisions and good decisions and that when we refuse to acknowledge one or the other side of those things, we deprive of ourselves of the opportunity to learn from people whose lives came before us. And finally, I wanna, I wanna go back to what I think is the biggest conclusion here. The thing that I realized, I was working on this talk and I will tell you this, I've never in my life spent more time working on one hour of talking because I love this organization and I did not want to blow it. And I, I, it occurred to me, at the time I worked at this, this is the greatest thing that I learned from Washington. When he died, everyone was convinced that he could not be replaced. But they replaced him. He's been dead for two and a quarter centuries and the project he helped establish is still going. That is a hell of a legacy. And I think when you look at what you're building in life as a leader, an organization for your community, for, you know, for your government, there's too much focus on some one person being indispensable. Oh, we need him, we need that person. Washington continued to tell people, you don't need me, and then he proved it. And then we proved that we were up to the task. And I hope we will continue doing that. Because if you want to leave a great legacy, be replaceable. Build something bigger than yourself and hope that it grows to be even a fraction as successful as our country has been. 
Thank you guys, I'm Ben Sawyer. I appreciate you being here. Thank you to NCSL. Have a great day. We, we do have some time for Q&A, and if you'd like to ask a question, I'm more than up for it. Uh, I think we've got like six or seven, well, no, eight minutes, and I would love to, oh, I would love to answer some questions. All right. How do we get a copy of your talk? Uh, it's streaming on NCSL. Also, I'll be selling them out of the back of my truck outside. Uh, <laughs> bootlegs. <laughs> I think it will be on NCSL's, uh, I think on their LinkedIn page. Yeah, but how do we get the copy? I don't think, I read. Email me. Email me, uh, you can email me my MTSU address. Uh, I, will, I will make sure you get a copy of it. Thank you so much. Yes? What's the one state that didn't have the fake funeral for Washington? I'm not sure which one it was. There, look, there's an amazing, amazing new book that just came out. It's co-edited by Lindsay Travinsky, the, who I mentioned earlier. It's called Mourning the Presidents. And it is an incredible look into the ceremonies around several presidents in the past. And it actually goes, it talks about Reagan's funeral. And, uh, you know, it's, it is amazing the way that people's lives and then the public remembrances, uh, you know, the remembrance shapes so much of the way we remember them and how that moment they die in, you know, particularly talking about Bush's funeral, uh, George H.W. Bush's funeral, at the time of division it was in, it meant something totally different than it would have meant if he had died 10 years earlier. And so I recommend that book. And uh, if you email me, I'll find that out. I kind of want to know now too. Which one? It might have been Rhode Island. They were weird. They didn't even show up to the government for the first year. Sorry, Rhode Island. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Y'all weren't, I mean, you know, they weren't at the Constitutional Convention. But, uh, yeah. What were his biggest mistakes? Washington's biggest mistakes on the battlefield? Or, or just in general? In the battlefield Well, I think Washington's uh, on the battlefield. I mean, he almost got captured at Brandywine Creek in 1777 because he got bad intel and put himself in the most flankable position on earth, and they almost lost. And uh, he was on the verge of being captured. This is when Lafayette had just shown up, and all he wanted to do was kill British people, but he didn't speak any English. It's kind of confusing, because he wasn't really. <laughs> and so he just kind of unleashes Lafayette on one of his flanks, and it turns out the guy's a maniac. He gets shot and keeps going. Um, so again, that's why you want to foster talent. I never know. <laughs> I mean, I think at the time, or in terms of legacy, I mean, I think, I think Mistake, I think he miscalculates, even though he knows that the partisanship is growing, because essentially when the government begins, when, when the federal, first federal government meets their armed parties and it forms viciously while he's in there, I think he overestimated his ability to overcome that. Um, and I think he knew that later on. Um, I also think that, I mean, personally in terms of, of legacy, I agree with Lafayette. It would have been a hell of a thing for him to do to, to, to acknowledge uh, the problems of, of slavery and to, to actually set a course more than he did. Uh, so there's, you know, there's the question of military, there's a question at the time, and then there's the question in terms of the, of the long term. Um, but yeah, that's, that's probably my best answer to that one. You talk about the difference between uh, the mythology and the history of individuals like Washington and others, um, and you made an important point about how we need to be better at that. How can, in general, <coughs> Uh, what I, the way to get people to interrogate it? Um, it's a general process that I think when people ask me how do you find good information or bad information right now when there's so much out there. I would say that anytime you encounter information that in no way makes you feel uncomfortable or rethink things, then you're in trouble. I mean, if you're constantly being verified in what you think, the odds that you've got everything figured out, pretty slim, that's a good warning sign. You're like, the internet agrees with me, but when I walk outside, people don't like me. You know, that's like a, a common thing. But it's also like, all right, look, I'll just give you this. Just, all right, all you gotta do is really think about some of the mythological stories and they don't make sense. Like, you know the cherry tree story? You guys know the story, George Washington chapter? You guys know it was totally made up, right? It's basically made up by a guy who, when Washington died, people wanted to buy the biography. A lot of people started writing one. It was hard to do, so this guy just made up some stories, got to market first, uh, went through several incarnations, got picked up in a, in a book in the, in the 19th century, and it spread. But just, if you just think about that story, it's pretty obvious that it's, there's problems with it. Like it, start, like, it starts off as just like a child's got an ax. You know what I'm saying? Like he's just hanging out and then his, he uses the ax to chop down his dad's favorite tree. 
And it's not like there were many people out there. They're like, they're, they, they, the dad goes to Washington and is like, did you do it? And then he goes, yeah, I did it. Like, that's kind of psycho, isn't it? He's like, what else do you love, dad? You know what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't. There's so many problems with these stories, right? So it's just like, kind of think it through, you know? Uh, would be my general advice on that. Yeah, at the wall. Thank you. I think that Washington's, uh, it's kind of personal to him. Like he has, he's very cordial, right? I mean, this is the funny thing about Washington is he's not like, he's not your buddy. Right? There's an apocryphal story about Governor Morris during the Constitutional Convention. Hamilton bet him that if he, Governor Morris was saying at the Constitutional Convention that Washington was cool and everything, and Hamilton was like, no, he's not. And so he told, I think, was it Hamilton said that he would buy 10 people a dinner that night if uh, Governor Morris walked over, slapped Washington on the shoulder, and said, my good man, how nice it is to see you. And Morris did it, and Washington turned and stared at him. <laughs> like, what is wrong with you? But this also comes from the fact that I think Washington understood his own flaws, his temper, which he knew he had. Uh, he kept it court. And I think the rules of civility and, and these types of things are important because there was a general understanding, particularly among him, but many of the founders, that uh, if all men were created equal, that meant, again, that God didn't create anybody better than anyone else, right? Our creator, we all created equal, which means we rise and fall based on our own decisions. And if that becomes the case and you're unhinged from the idea that you're born into a destiny that you are set to fulfill, which really is the basis of the American Revolution, right? That we're not destined, we, are, we make our own decisions. We have liberties to choose. When you, take, when you take that into account, you understand that you have to regulate your own actions more, more specifically. So I, I can't remember you know, the specific list of civilities that Washington had. But I think in general, I mean, he was very proper and, and kind of kept his emotions under the cap. And I, I think in public engagement, that might not be the worst thing. You know, everybody's all impressed when somebody's like, I told them, and I'm like, maybe you shouldn't have, you know? You don't get on the internet that way, but that's okay. Anybody else? Yeah. As a foremost expert on Washington, um, how did he handle an overcoming trial? Oh, um... Well, I, I don't want to make clear here, I would not consider myself to be one of the foremost experts. I owe a lot of what I know to other great historians. But I will say, not well when it was Benedict Arnold. <laughs> nah, he was pretty mad about that. Um, he, when Madison and Jefferson turned on him and they had a rift, uh, that, that didn't repair. Um, in fact, the farewell address he issued in 1796, he actually written by the hand of Hamilton. It was kind of a, a return to the two of them who had, who had had that formative moment on the battlefield during the American Revolution. But when he had originally shown up there and planned to leave during his first term, he had already had a farewell address uh, written that Madison had written. And in between that and the time he decides to resign after his second term, they've fallen out. So he turns away from Madison and goes to Hamilton to craft it. Um, so I think he felt deeply betrayed because uh, he wanted to avoid partisanship. Everyone knew that. Madison had dragged him out there. I mean, Madison's the one who lets him know, guess what, you're the president of our delegation to Virginia. You've got to be there. And he's like, cool, I'll do that. I don't want to. And they're like, no, you've got to be the president. He's like, okay, I'll do that too. And he's like, also, you're the worst. Like, what? Like, you could have just laid off. So he, he had anger issues a lot of the time, and I, I think that he never, he never really seemed to have gotten past those things. So I don't know. I wish I had something better there for you. Still want it, I guess, would be the advice. Uh, yes. Cousin, ten generations removed. Uh, but uh, his his great grandfather, Nicholas Martinow, Martinow. What was the correct pronunciation? I don't know, actually. Martinow. Martinow. Let's say Martinow. <laughs> Anyone here with that last name? If not, we'll go with it. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm not weighing in on that one. There's been a debate about. It? I'm not weighing in on that one. I've already got. Enough. <laughs> no, but that's, it is interesting, and I suspect that at the time, different people pronounced it different ways. It's the reason we've got all these same weird spellings of the same, the same name uh, here. 
You know, people didn't used to obsess about names that much. They'd just be like, what's your name? And they'd be like, Ricky? And they'd be like, okay, cool. You write that? Nah, I just sign X's. All right, sure, okay. Um, yeah, anybody else? All right, well, thank you so much for being here. This has been a privilege to be here and speak to you. And I thank you so much. Please keep supporting your uh, public universities.